Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Grace Lutheran Podcast. This is Pastor Matt Nupel. Thank you so much for tuning into our show today as we discuss different issues and topics about our faith and lives in Jesus Christ. And as always, if you are in the Winston-Salem or Pofftown area and you're looking for a church that offers traditional Christ-centered worship and is able to offer weekly Holy Communion, you are always invited to join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at 3410 Community Church Road in Pofftown. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, First, we've had several members at Grace express interest in starting our own community garden. Uh, So this year, we're inviting people to contribute uh, whatever plants they'd like Grace to have in our garden. We need to start planning how large our garden needs to be and how much space we'll need. So there's going to be signups available this week at Grace for the number and type of plants you intend on bringing. Uh, We do need to start building it in about a week or so. Uh, But if you let us know before then, we'll be sure to make space available. In the meantime, if you're listening and you'd like to contribute, you're welcome to comment below or message us directly, and I'll be happy to sign you up on our list. Second, I wanted to let everyone know that we'll be holding a midweek evening prayer service with the Lord's Supper on Wednesday, May 5th at 7 p.m. Midweek services are an opportunity for the community of saints to gather at the middle of the point between Sunday services. Just like many of us need that caffeine boost halfway through our workday, Some of us need that extra boost of faith when our week is especially strenuous. So my hope and prayer is that these midweek services are an opportunity for Grace to find their needed rest in God outside of Sunday morning. Lastly, some of our listeners have been asking about Scott, who was scheduled to have knee surgery last week. Uh, Unfortunately, the surgeon noticed a pretty significant scratch on Scott's knee that made them nervous, so they postponed the surgery for a later date. Obviously, this isn't the best news, but we're also fortunate that the medical staff isn't willing to take these kinds of careless risks. So our prayer for Scott continues as he prepares for his surgery at an unspecified date at this time. So if you clicked on this link because you saw the thumbnail or read the title, you're probably wondering what these weird Latin words are and what they mean. Uh, So that's what we're going to be talking about today. That is the two directions a minister of word and sacrament may face when celebrating the Lord's Supper, ad orientum, or facing away from the people, or versus populum, or facing toward the people. Those at Grace Lutheran know that since we moved into our new church building in Pofftown, we received a beautiful altar that was used by the church community before us, When we purchased the property, the altar was left in the sanctuary against the far wall of the chancel. At the time, it seemed the most sensible and respectful to leave the altar in its place, just as we left the lectern and the pulpit in their same places. As a result, this caused me to start celebrating the Lord's Supper in the ad orientum posture, or facing away from the assembly toward the altar. However, I realize now that celebrating Holy Communion this way might be unfamiliar to a portion of grace. I've had several people approach me and ask me questions about this, so it's not exactly a secret around grace that this is a little unique and unfamiliar. While facing away from the assembly is a common Lutheran practice in places like Pennsylvania and throughout the Midwest, it can be seen as a little too Catholic uh, by those who grew up with a stronger evangelical or Bible Belt influence. So today, we're going to start by talking about the history and differences of these two methods of presiding over the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of each. And by the end, I will hopefully make my best case as to why I believe celebrating the sacrament in the posture of ad orientum is the most liturgically fitting within the divine service. As we begin, it bears mentioning, and likely repeating throughout this episode, uh, that God obviously hears the prayers of his people and offers the body and blood of his son, Jesus Christ, to us, no matter which way the minister is facing. Uh, This debate on which way is more liturgically appropriate uh, does not mean that one way is sinful, or that one way is the only way that we're allowed to preside. Uh, This is clearly a highly non-essential issue that pastors are welcome to disagree on and to make their own judgments based on the needs of their assembly. So first, let's talk about ad orientum. Uh, 
As I mentioned, this posture is the one that a minister takes when they face away from the assembly and toward the altar. But in Latin, this phrase literally means facing the east. As I've mentioned in past episodes like our Advent special, the early church saw a strong biblical connection between the arrival of Jesus Christ into our world and the sunrise. In the last chapter of the book of Malachi, the prophet refers to the coming Messiah as the sun of righteousness that rises with healing on its wings. And so we talked about how Advent is the season of preparation for the coming of Christ, the light of the world, into our world of darkness as a sunrise. So it's no surprise that we see early Christian communities orienting their morning worship toward the east in the direction that the sunlight first breaks the darkness. As a side note, it's also worth mentioning how Christians began worshiping towards the east long before Islam did. And in fact, some believe Muslims borrowed their recognizable practice of praying in a unified direction from the Byzantine Christians of the 6th and 7th centuries. In any case, this posture of ad orientum, or facing the east, began as a designation of the direction that all of those in worship were meant to face, that is, the east. Basil of Caesarea, the early church father who writes during the 4th century, tells us that praying towards the east is one of the oldest unwritten laws of the church. Uh, While he might be overstating his case a little bit, uh, he's at least indicating that this practice of the church facing the east in a unified way during prayer is something that's been around for a long time, even in his day. Here's just a couple more quotes from some church fathers who come even before Basil. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, who's in the 3rd century, writes this, Since the dawn is an image of the day of birth, and from that point the light which is shown forth at first from the darkness increases, there has also dawned on those involved in darkness a day of knowledge of truth. In correspondence with the manner of the sun's rising, prayers are made looking towards the sunrise in the east. Origen, who writes about 40 years after Clement, uh, says this, The fact that of all the quarters of the heavens, the east is the only direction we turn to when we pour our prayer, the reasons for this, I think, are not easily discovered by anyone. Praying in a unified, single direction was a common practice of the church given to us by some of the earliest Christian writers that we have. And the reasons that these church fathers give us for why they pray towards the east are all based in biblical principles. As I'm sure you can imagine, as Christianity began to gain influence and spread throughout the West, it became a lot more difficult and much less practical to always construct churches in a way that oriented towards the East. So while a lot of church sanctuaries in the West were no longer facing East, they still kept this unified posture of prayer where the presider would face the altar away from the people. So this term ad orientum was kept to refer to this liturgical direction, even though they were no longer facing the geographical direction east. When it comes to teaching the reasons and the purpose behind the traditional liturgy to those who maybe aren't accustomed to it in the United States, I find there's a lot of demythologizing that has to happen, uh, or to explain to them why a lot of the myths that Protestants have created around traditional worship are false. One of these myths is that ad orientum was developed throughout the Middle Ages and that it was created as an attempt to separate the priesthood from the laity. And it was meant to emphasize the magical powers of the priest to consecrate the elements. I wish I knew how a lot of these ridiculous myths got started, uh, but hopefully I've demonstrated by quoting people like Origen and Clement of Alexandria that this is demonstrably false. The reasons the earliest Christians give us for why they felt so compelled to pray in a unified direction had nothing to do with separating the priesthood from the laity. In fact, the reasons they give indicate the opposite, that they were trying to highlight the unity that existed between the person presiding over Holy Communion and the people in the gathered assembly. Now that we've talked about the history and the purpose behind ad orientum, Why don't we shift gears and talk a little bit about versus populum, or the posture of facing toward the people when celebrating Holy Communion. When considering the previous myth that I hopefully debunked, uh, 
Uh, it's a pretty ironic fact of church history when you consider that the first instance we find of someone celebrating Holy Communion versus Populum, or facing the people, is in the Basilica of Rome, in the Roman Catholic Church. It seems the direction of versus Populum was the standard for at least the churches in the city of Rome until about the 8th century AD. The churches of the Frankish Empire had been worshipping ad orientum for centuries before this point, and so when the Frankish Empire overtook Rome, ad orientum eventually became the standard in the city of Rome as well. For the sake of presenting versus populum in the most unbiased way I can, I'm going to read for you a quote by Martin Luther. Here, meaning in Wittenberg, we retain vestments, the altar, and candles until they are used up or we are pleased to make a change, but we do not oppose anyone who would do otherwise. In the true mass, however, of real Christians, the altar should not remain where it is, and the priest should always face the people as Christ doubtlessly did in his Last Supper. So while Lutheran pastors can take various positions on this, and Martin Luther even allows for disagreement, we do have to reckon with the fact that our great reformer, Martin Luther, did strongly prefer versus populum in his celebration of Holy Communion. Like many of those who prefer versus populum, Martin Luther sees a strong sense of the pastor being the ambassador of Christ to the people in this position. In the versus populum posture, the pastor is putting themselves in the position of Jesus Christ and is presenting the elements of the Last Supper as Christ did. It's also been argued that versus populum is a more intimate way for the pastor to celebrate Holy Communion, in a way that signifies table fellowship. While versus populum was Luther's preference, it's interesting to see that a lot of the Lutheran churches that came after Martin Luther didn't agree with him on this. Uh, we do see some Lutheran churches that did pull their altar out at his request, but there were a lot that didn't and they wanted to maintain the traditional liturgy that had been handed down to them by tradition. This may go without saying, but anything Martin Luther wrote outside of the Lutheran confessions, namely outside of his writings of the small catechism, the large catechism, and the small called articles, anything Luther wrote outside of these is his opinion. We're not compelled to hold to it as any kind of authoritative truth or standard just because he has the name Luther. In the 1940s in the Roman Catholic Church, there was this large historical and liturgical renewal that eventually resulted in the Second Vatican Council, or Vatican II. This ushered in a ton of changes for the Roman Catholic Church, but one of these was the allowance for priests to start celebrating the Eucharist versus populum, or facing the people. This is why it's more common to see a freestanding altar in most Roman Catholic churches today because a lot of them agreed with Vatican II's decision to start celebrating the Eucharist versus Populum. With all of these facts in mind, I want to encourage our listeners to try your best to steer away from this common misconception of Catholic on one side and Protestant on the other, as if ad orientum is the Catholic way to do Holy Communion and versus Populum is the Protestant way to do Holy Communion. This is a false dichotomy, it doesn't exist historically, and it's one that's a pretty recent innovation. As I stated at the beginning of this episode, I believe that there's a degree of nuance that exists with this issue. I believe pastors do have a degree of freedom to celebrate Holy Communion in a way that is most fitting and most irreverent to the sacrament, but also best serves the assembly to which they've been called. Also, I realize this discussion is only relevant to a small handful of churches that are around today in the United States. For instance, if you're a Baptist minister listening to this, I really, really don't recommend that you start worshiping ad orientum this Sunday, especially if you wear a suit and tie or jeans to church. Uh, obviously, there is a style clash there that really isn't appropriate, and so that's not what we're talking about. Um, this issue addresses churches that understand the purpose of the liturgy, its importance, and why we hold on to things like tradition. For those of us Christians who appreciate and understand the importance of things like vestments or liturgical gestures like signing the cross, I'm going to try to state my case as to why ad orientum makes the most sense 
within this context of liturgical worship. First, much like the early church fathers like Clement of Alexandria and Origen, I believe that Ad Orientum emphasizes our unity as the body of Christ, both between pastor and laity. When we're offering prayers and worship, I as the pastor am always facing the altar as a sign of our joined prayers praying to the same being. This is something that I did even at the funeral home before we moved into our new church space. So when we consider the fact that the Eucharistic liturgy that we lift up every Sunday is a prayer to God the Father, then it only makes sense to continue in this same line of thought and treat Holy Communion as a prayer. It's interesting to me how people can see versus populum as the less Catholic or the more Protestant approach to Holy Communion, because what that gesture signifies is that I somehow have in my own being power over the elements and power over the assembly. Again, if you're listening to this and you celebrate Holy Communion versus Populum, I'm not saying this is what you believe about Holy Communion. What I am saying is that if you look at the purpose behind our worship and the context into which we're offering these prayers, then... Facing the same way seems to be more in line with agreeing that I, as the pastor, am one with the people. And versus populum seems to communicate that the pastor is doing something special that no one else is doing. Second, and I believe this one is really important, celebrating ad orientum communicates to people that we as a Lutheran church do not believe the same thing that 95% of other Protestants in Winston-Salem believe about Holy Communion. I say this with as much compassion as I can for Protestants like Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, because I do believe that we are all Christians and that we all make up the body of Christ, but we do not agree when it comes to Holy Communion, and we can't keep pretending that we agree just because we're all in the same Protestant bubble. As Lutherans, we confess that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that we are not just celebrating a symbolic memorial meal. This is not just some spiritual activity where Jesus is kind of vaguely present in our midst. This is not what the Lutheran confessions say. Lutherans believe that Jesus Christ offers us his real body and his real blood for us to consume for the purpose of our forgiveness of sins. With the possible exception of Anglicans, there is not a single Protestant that will agree with us on this confession. So is our altar situated differently than the Methodist Church downtown? It is, because we do not believe the same thing that the Methodists believe about Holy Communion. Third, like anything liturgical that we do, Ad Orientum is a subtle way that we continue to unify ourselves to the universal, historical Church of Christ. When we are worshiping Ad Orientum, and when we celebrate the Lord's Supper in this uniform direction, we can be confident that we are putting ourselves in the shoes of hundreds of thousands of Christians that have come before us, facing the same direction, looking at the same altar, and beholding the same Eucharist. So, Church, after almost a year of being called to Grace Lutheran, I hope you know me well enough now to know that I'm not going to create or innovate things in the liturgy just for the sake of being traditional. As I've taken time in the past to explain aspects of our liturgy, I believe it's very important that if we're going to do things in worship, that they have purpose and that they're there to teach us something about Jesus Christ. If you've listened to this episode and you still aren't quite convinced about the whole ad orientum thing, that is completely fine. This discussion does not have a closed door. I am always available for questions or concerns you might have about this. But I hope after today you see that this was not a decision that was made flippantly or a decision that was made for the sake of doing liturgical traditional things. But I believe that Ad Orientum teaches the body of Christ something vital about the role of the pastor, the role of the assembly, and the purpose of the sacrament within our worship. Well, it looks like that's going to be all the time we have for today. I want to thank you again for tuning into this program. If you liked this episode, feel free to comment below or send us a message. But in the meantime, we hope and pray that you have a great rest of your week. 
Take care and God bless.